Robert's Rebellion, also known as the War of the Usurper, marked a significant revolt against House Targaryen that took place about 17 years before the War of the Five Kings. For almost a year, the Seven Kingdoms bore witness to this monumental battle, culminating in the eclipse of the Targaryen dynasty and the rise of Robert Baratheon's reign. In this video, we will be covering the complete story of Robert's rebellion from the birth of Rhaegar Targaryen to the Mad King's death. And if you like everything related to the Game of Thrones universe and the Song of Ice and Fire, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Welcome to the Three-Eyed Raven. Before we begin this video, we would like to thank our loyal audience who supports with their views. Your continued support means a lot to us. If you would like to support our channel even more as we continue to create the content we all love, there are two additional ways to do so, by placing an order in our merchandise store, or by purchasing George R. R. Martin's books, either an audiobook or print version, through our affiliate link. Thank you for being part of our community. This story begins in 259 after the conquest, in a castle located in a region known as Dornish Marches, Summer Hall. An Eden destined to be the refuge of the members of House Targaryen, during the warm seasons. In other words, this castle was a place for the family to spend their vacations, when the weather was not so favorable in King's Landing. At this time, the king was Aegon the Unlikely, also known as Egg. He was the squire of Duncan the Tall when he was a boy, and was perhaps one of the most beloved and benevolent kings of the Targaryen family. He was a fair and very intelligent person. As he spent much of his life as a squire to Duncan, while traveling throughout Westeros, he learned to be empathetic to the people. Egg, obsessed with the dream of restoring dragons in Westeros, set out on a desperate search for ancient teachings and precious knowledge. On the night of the tragedy, Aegon had summoned those closest to him to celebrate the imminent birth of his first great-grandson, Rhaegar Targaryen. The festivities turned into a disaster, and Aegon's ambition to bring the dragons back to life, through a dark combination of sorcery and Valyrian fire, resulted in an uncontrolled fire that consumed Summerhall and much of its attendees. Some people claim that what happened that day, was that Egg took several dragon eggs, and subjected them to a Valyrian ritual with fire and pyromancers, which caused an accident where most of the Targaryen family lost their lives. Some think it was the fire that got out of control that wiped them all out. Others claim that it was actually Egg who sacrificed his family members in the ritual, in an attempt to bring the dragons back to life. This hypothesis about the Summerhall tragedy is quite disturbing, because at the end of his days, Egg may have allowed the Targaryen madness to take over his mind. While the catastrophe of Summerhall is a milestone in itself, it also serves as a tragic foreshadowing for the events that led to Robert's rebellion three decades later. Amidst the chaos and fire of that fateful night, Prince Rhaegar Targaryen was born, whose fate was irrevocably tied to the fall of his dynasty. Prince Rhaegar Targaryen was born amidst his mother's weeping at the tragedy of Summerhall and the fire that consumed the castle. Between salt and fire. According to an ancient Westeros legend, the prince that was promised would be born between salt and fire, which led many to believe that Rhaegar was indeed the prince that was promised. There is one thing we must understand about this tragedy, which is that although Egg failed to bring back the dragons, a dragon was born that day. Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. It is believed that on this day, almost every Targaryen became extinct. It is for this reason that so few Targaryen exist, when the Game of Thrones stories begin. From his birth, Rhaegar Targaryen became an emblem of hope and tragedy for House Targaryen. On that fateful day when the fires embraced the summer residence, Rhaegar came into the world, marking the beginning of a life defined by promise and doom. Growing up in the shadows of the Red Keep at King's Landing, Rhaegar was formed as the heir to the Iron Throne. A right that belonged by law to his father, Ares II, 
yet seemed to many to be Rhaegar's own destiny. Throughout his childhood and adolescence, Rhaegar demonstrated an insatiable passion for reading and knowledge, an intellectual hunger that eclipsed most of his peers. Rhaegar was one of the finest warriors in King's Landing. He was also an artist, considered a near-perfect prince. But Rhaegar lived with the weight of what had happened on the day he was born. Perhaps he felt some responsibility for what happened that day. At the age of 17, the year 276 before the conquest, Rhaegar was knighted, and despite his initial efforts as a scholar, he proved to be a formidable fighter. However, his penchant for fighting did not seem to match that of other famous warriors, such as Robert Baratheon or Jaime Lannister. Rhaegar was rather a reserved, introspective and melancholic man, who found solace in the melodies from his harp rather than in the thrill of combat. Rhaegar used to visit the ruins of Summerhall, the place of his birth, carrying only his harp with him. However, Rhaegar himself thought he was the prince that was promised, and tried to train in combat for when the time came to fulfill the prophecy. But King Aerys knew that the only way to keep the Targaryen bloodline alive was for his son to reproduce but this posed a problem, because Rhaegar had no sisters. The prince was born during a difficult period for his family. The Targaryens were in decline, and the situation was made even more difficult by the tragedy of Summerhall. There was no one in his family whom he could marry, according to Targaryen tradition. King Aerys, seeing that his family was fading, decided to find a wife for Rhaegar. He sent his cousin, Lord Stefan Baratheon, to find a suitable woman for Rhaegar. Stefan traveled from King's Landing to Essos, where there were still people with Valyrian blood like the Targaryens. However, the search was not easy. Although there were people with Valyrian blood in Essos, not all were of noble rank enough to marry a Targaryen prince. Stefan searched every corner of Essos, but could not find a woman worthy of Rhaegar. Therefore, it was thought that the best way to solve the problem was to marry Rhaegar to a woman from a noble family of the Seven Kingdoms, in order to improve political relations in Westeros. In the year 279 after the conquest, Rhaegar was betrothed to Princess Elia Martell, although the Lannister family desired Rhaegar to marry Cersei. The fact that King Aerys preferred the Martell family to marry his son, and not the Lannisters, was one of the causes for paying a great price. Rhaegar was then betrothed to Elia Martell, Princess of Dorne, and they were married in the year 280. However, some people speculate that Rhaegar's marriage to Elia occurred because Rhaegar was convinced that one of his sons would be the prince that was promised, and that his marriage fulfilled the prophecy. While Rhaegar's father, the Mad King, was sinking deeper into madness every day, within his own castle there were plots to destroy his family. Every day the rumors of revenge, betrayal, and fire increased. During the year 281 after the conquest, known as the Year of the False Spring, the grandeur of an unparalleled tournament was summoned to the historic Heron Hall, the formidable fortress in Westeros of Lord Walter Went. The tall twisted towers of Harrenhal, which had been the silent witness to many battles and misadventures, were set to be the stage for this opulent parade of knights and nobles. The fortress, famous as it was for its dark and desolate appearance, had been transformed. Its dark and crumbling walls, resounding with groaning echoes of the past, were now a rainbow of vivid colors. The banners of the noble families of Westeros, waved proudly each representing a different lineage and a unique history. The atmosphere was saturated with laughter and expectant murmurs. The air, which was usually permeated with a somber heaviness, now crackled with electrifying anticipation. The tournament promised to be a spectacle for the ages. However, it is thought that Walter Went was not really the organizer of this tournament. 
Some rumors pointed out that Rhaegar Targaryen secretly gave money to Went to create the biggest tournament in history, so that all the noble houses and knights of the kingdom would gather in the same place to have a meeting with him. For which, Lord Walter Went announced that the prizes of this tournament would be three times more than the prizes they gave in the last tournament ten years before. But why did Rhaegar wish to have all the noble families in one place? There are two important reasons why the Dragon Prince did this behind his father's back. First, Ares was going mad. All the people who disagreed with him ended up burned. His behavior was erratic and paranoid. Which is why, even though Rhaegar was the rightful heir, he could present some kind of danger to the king, who did not want to give up his crown. Varys, the Mad King's Master of Whispers, warned the Mad King that his son was organizing a secret meeting to plot against him, so the Mad King took his entourage and transported himself from King's Landing to Heron Hall. Rhaegar was a follower of the prophecies of the prince that was promised, so the meeting might be intended to unite the Seven Kingdoms under one rule, as Rhaegar himself thought he was the prince that was promised. Perhaps this was the moment when Rhaegar was going to take his place as king, and replace his father. During the great feast that followed the announcement of the tournament, the lords and ladies of Westeros gathered in the Great Hall of Heron Hall. Music filled the air, wine goblets were filled and emptied, and laughter echoed off the high stone walls. In this celebratory setting, Rhaegar Targaryen took up his silver harp and began to play. Rhaegar, known for both his skill with the sword and his talent with music, plucked the strings of his harp, and sang a song so beautiful and melancholy, that the hearts of all present stopped. The music floated in the air, capturing everyone's attention, and silencing laughter and conversation. Lyanna Stark, the young she-wolf of Winterfell, was among those in attendance. Known for her indomitable spirit and bravery, Lyanna listened to Rhaegar's song with tear-filled eyes. Though she was known for her strength, the sadness in Rhaegar's voice touched her heart, and tears rolled down her cheeks. Brandon Stark, seeing his sister crying, began to taunt her, and she threw a goblet of wine at his head. But in that moment, the connection between Lyanna and Rhaegar became apparent, foreshadowing the events that transpired during and after the tournament. The day of the tournament finally arrived, and the colossal Heron Hall structure became the stage for this monumental event. Lords and ladies, knights and squires, merchants and commoners, all gathered under the grim specter of the ruined castle. Their banners and emblems floating in the fresh spring air. However, in the midst of the excitement and rejoicing, a somber incident occurred. Howland Reed, a northern nobleman of House Reed, was harassed and assaulted by squires of houses Fry, Hay, and Blunt. Howland Reed, who was known at the time as a simple Cranagman, was harassed because of his place of origin. The Neck is a region of Westeros that is swampy, inhabited by ancient people carrying on the traditions of the First Men. In this place, there was a small Cranagman who dreamed of knowing the whole world, and one of his travels took him to Heron Hall. Unfortunately, these people mocked and discriminated against him. First they took away his spear, and began to beat him while calling him a frog eater, which was a common insult for people who lived in the neck of the west, since as mentioned, it was a swampy place. While the young Cranagman was receiving a beating, which some believe was Howland Reed, a young woman arrived with a tournament sword, and attacked the three squires, defeating them and making them run. According to the story, this warrior woman was a she-wolf, that is, the young Cranagman was saved by Lyanna Stark, who was also in the tournament. This information completely changes the perception we have of Lyanna Stark. She was not just a damsel in distress, Lyanna was a warrior who fought against injustice, similar to what Arya was. But the story doesn't end there. Lyanna took the little man to her brothers, healed his wounds and invited him to the tournament. 
Harren Hall sparkled with inaugural festivities, and it was then that Ares Targaryen II, the Mad King, made his appearance. His restless eyes, disheveled hair, and erratic behavior offered an unsettling counterpoint to the celebrations. This must have come as a great surprise to Rhaegar. In the midst of the feast, King Aerys II, in a strategic move, appointed Jaime Lannister, the proud lion of Casterly Rock, as a member of the Kingsguard. Thus the tournament began with its first surprise. The jousting, the heart and soul of any tournament, began with a roar. Knights clad in shining armor, faced each other on the jousting field. Their spears clashed, and the crowd cheered each blow. But in the midst of the competition, a mysterious figure emerged, the Knight of the Laughing Tree. Nameless and landless, he challenged and defeated those knights, whose squires had humiliated Howell and Reed. The Knight of the Laughing Tree was also short in stature, and defeated the three knights in combat. He then said that the only prize he wanted was for the knights to educate their squires, so that they would not harass other people. The Laughing Tree is connected to beliefs in the Old Gods and the Weirwoods, which links this knight to the North. For many, this mysterious knight was the Cranagman himself, who thanks to the Old Gods, managed to have the strength to defeat the three knights. However, others think that it was really Lyanna Stark. The people acclaimed this mysterious knight, and this caused distrust to Ares, the Mad King, so he ordered his son to chase this knight of the Laughing Tree. The story goes that Rhaegar only found the shield of this knight, but possibly Rhaegar really found this knight and fought with him, when he realized that behind that armor, there was Lyanna Stark. This was the moment when the young dragon met the she-wolf. He realized that she was a righteous woman, who fought for justice by defending the Cranagman, and he saw that behind the mask, hid one of the most beautiful women he had ever seen in his life. While a paranoid Ares waited for Rhaegar to bring the head of a mysterious knight, Rhaegar was about to cause his family's own extinction. The jousting continued until the final moment arrived. In the final joust, Rhaegar Targaryen, the Dragon Prince, faced Ser Barristan Tanselmi, the most famous knight of his time. With one spectacular blow, Rhaegar defeated Selmy, emerging as the champion of the tournament. But it was his next action that sent shockwaves through the crowd. Bypassing his wife, Princess Elia of Dorne, Rhaegar approached Lyanna Stark, and placed the crown of winter blue roses in her lap, crowning her as the Queen of Love and Beauty. When Rhaegar Targaryen passed over his own wife, to crown Lyanna Stark as the tournament's Queen of Love and Beauty, it was a moment that left everyone in shock and surprise. In the crowd, Robert Baratheon, Lyanna's betrothed, watched the situation with a mixture of fury and dismay. Robert, a man of great strength and an equally strong temperament, had always been known for his outspoken and light-hearted nature. But at this instant, it is said his expression darkened, and his good humor vanished. The seeds of war are sown during peace, and this tournament was the origin of Robert's rebellion, and the rivalry between the Dragon Prince and the young Baratheon. A rivalry that led them to face each other to death for the love of Lyanna Stark. Robert's story begins one stormy afternoon in the year 262 after the conquest. Robert Baratheon was born at Storm's End, the ancestral home of the Baratheons. His early days were lulled by the constant thunder of rain against the stones, and the deafening roar of the sea winds. A soundtrack that forged young Robert's indomitable spirit. Some believe these storms were an omen of Robert's own rebellion the storm that would destroy the Targaryens. When Robert was five years old, the two brothers were taken to court by their father, where they were received by the hand of the king, Lord Tywin Lannister, seated on the Iron Throne. It was there that Robert's father, Stephen, thought Robert needed a noble education, so he spoke to John Arryn, the Warden of the East and Defender of the Vale, to educate him and serve as his mentor. 
It was on his travels to the Vale that Robert met Eddard Stark, but more on that later. During his trip to King's Landing, when he was just a boy, Robert saw the throne for the first time and imagined himself sitting on it. No one knew that in a few years, that boy would become the King of the Seven Kingdoms. Despite his noble birth, his childhood was not exempt from adversity. Robert was with his brother Stannis one day in the Towers of Storm's End, watching his father, Stefan Baratheon, return by ship from Essos. He had spent a lengthy time in Essos trying to find a wife for Rhaegar but had been unable to find anything. He only found a jester who caught his eye, who was quite clever, named Patchface. This jester appeared to have some kind of supernatural power or was a magic user. But we will talk about this character in the future. What is important, is that he may have been the cause of Stefan's end. While his two sons watched from a distance, they saw how their parents lost their lives, when the ship hit the rocks of Storm's End. That day marked Robert Baratheon forever. Losing his parents in a storm at sea while still very young, Robert witnessed the volatility of power and the cruelty of fate. Feelings that remained with him throughout his life. It was then that along with his brother Stannis, he took on the heavy burden of the Lordship of Storm's End. It is here that Robert became the Lord of this place, at just 16 years of age. Robert then began to ask for help from his master John Aaron, a man of honor and wisdom, who became the father figure Robert and his close friend Eddard Stark so desperately needed. John Aaron, who had no sons of his own, took the two boys under his wing, teaching them not only the arts of war but also the meaning of justice and duty. During that time, Robert demonstrated an innate ability to fight with his robust and strong body, becoming a fearsome adversary on the battlefield. His weapon of choice was a war hammer, an extension of his unbridled strength. Although he was always a charismatic and attractive figure, Robert Baratheon was distinguished by his charm, and his knack for making friends, earning the affection of those who knew him. Robert was a young man full of passions, and one of the greatest was his love for his friend Ned's sister, Lyanna Stark. His love for Lyanna was so strong, that even after knowing that he had an illegitimate daughter in the Vale of Arryn, Maya Stone, he continued with his purpose of marrying Lyanna. On her part, we know that Lyanna possibly did not wish to be with Robert, for the story goes that she mentioned he would not be a one-bed man, as he had unrecognized daughters. Having such an honorable brother as Ned, perhaps Lyanna desired something more. But Ned's father promised her to Robert since the young man was the Lord of Storm's End, and this would strengthen the North politically. However, her life took another turn at the Tournament of Hall in the year 281 after the conquest, when Prince Rhaegar Targaryen won the tournament and crowned Lyanna as the Queen of Love and Beauty. A gesture that Robert considered a direct insult. Although he tried to disguise it with a smile, Ned knew that Robert was very upset with the Dragon Prince, and fate gifted them a match on the battlefield. The tension between the North and King's Landing increased when Lyanna was apparently kidnapped by Rhaegar. Consumed by anger and unrequited love, Robert joined Eddard Stark to fight against House Targaryen. Rhaegar could not ignore the undeniable and deep attraction he felt for Lyanna Stark, the she-wolf of Winterfell. However, things were not so simple. An ancient prophecy of House Targaryen, which spoke about the prince that was promised and the song of ice and fire, haunted his mind. The story goes that since his birth, Prince Rhaegar had wished to fulfill the prophecy of the prince that was promised. This secret, it's been passed from king to heir since Egon's time. It was a dream. Just to begin with a terrible winter, gusting out of the distant north. And whatever dwells within, will destroy the world of the living. And if the world of men is to survive, a Targaryen must be seated on the Iron Throne. Strong enough to unite the realm against the cold and the dark. The love songs and tales of Lyanna's legendary beauty and indomitable spirit had reached Rhaegar's ears. 
Thus, with his heart conflicted and the fate of the Seven Kingdoms hanging in a delicate balance, Rhaegar met Lyanna ten leagues from Harrenhal. It was there, on the shores of the vibrant Triton, that obsession and love came together in a passionate rapture. With the company of his loyal knight Sir Arthur Dane, and Sir Oswell went, Rhaegar took Lyanna and together they journeyed to Dorne. Whether for love or to fulfill a prophecy, or perhaps both, the union of these two hearts was secretly sealed in the Tower of Joy. The Wilderness of Dorne, warm and far from the critical gazes of the Seven Kingdoms, served as a refuge for their love. Rhaegar and Lyanna lived moments of intense passion there, forgetting for a while the responsibilities and obligations of their respective houses. In each other's embrace, they found not only a passionate love, but also a chance to fulfill the ancient prophecy of the Song of Ice and Fire. Elia and Rhaegar had two children, a daughter named Rhaenys, and a son named Aegon. Rhaegar chose these names based on the history of the Targaryens and their dragons. Rhaenys and Aegon were two of the three dragon siblings who conquered the Seven Kingdoms, along with their sister Visenya. One name was missing for Rhaegar in this pattern, Visenya. Although Elia could not have any more children after Aegon, due to her delicate health, Rhaegar still hoped for a third child. Some argue that this is where Lyanna, the ice she-wolf, comes in. If the relationship between Rhaegar and Lyanna was motivated in part by the prophecy, then their union may have been a hope for the prince to give birth to this third dragon head. Starks are usually known for living in the cold, in the ice. Perhaps something sparked in Rhaegar's mind, possibly the Song of Ice and Fire was the Song of the Starks and the Targaryens. Prophecies are often symbolic, and for a poet and singer like Rhaegar to see this prophecy as something metaphorical would not be uncommon. They're at the Tower of Joy, an ironically cheerful name for such a melancholy and tragic story, was the place in Dorne where Rhaegar took Lyanna. A remote spot, far from the world, protected by the massive Red Mountains. Dorne was so different from Lyanna's icy north, and even more distant from Rhaegar's courtly atmosphere. Here, in this place full of wildflowers, and with the sun shining tirelessly, these two lovers took refuge. Accompanied by Rhaegar's two most loyal knights, Sir Arthur Dane and Sir Oswell Went, they spent their days in the Tower of Joy. Amid the desert heat, the passion between Lyanna and Rhaegar blossomed. There were no courtiers to judge, no feudal duties to attend to. Just them and the vastness of the desert. Her, a Stark from the land of eternal winter, was his song of ice. Him, a Targaryen from ancient Valyria, was his song of fire. Together, they could fulfill the prophecy, but life in this universe is not so easy, and Lyanna Stark's disappearance was an event that brought the House of the Dragon to its knees. The moment Lyanna Stark disappeared with Rhaegar Targaryen, the Seven Kingdoms were plunged into a sea of uncertainty and confusion. Rhaegar, the crown prince to the Iron Throne, was married to Elia Martell. On her side, Lyanna was betrothed to Robert Baratheon, a powerful lord whose frank and passionate character had conquered her heart. The North reacted with horror and fury. The Honorable House Stark was deeply outraged. Lyanna was the beloved daughter of Lord Ricard Stark, and the betrothed of Robert Baratheon. Her disappearance was seen as an unacceptable insult, an affront to honor and decency. Brandon Stark, Lyanna's older brother and heir to Winterfell, filled with rage, rode to King's Landing to confront Rhaegar. But Rhaegar was not there. According to some theories, a few suggest that Littlefinger was to blame for creating rumors about Lyanna's abduction. Remember that Brandon Stark was Caitlyn's betrothed, the woman Littlefinger loved. It was in his interest for the young wolf to confront the dragon prince, so that he would lose his life in battle and he would have a chance with Caitlyn. Whether it was Littlefinger's fault or the fault of anyone else in the kingdom, what we know is that Brandon rode with his father to King's Landing to confront Rhaegar. There were rumors that the prince had somehow kidnapped and abused Lyanna, and her brother would save her. However, Prince Rhaegar was not there to respond to the challenge. 
Instead, King Ares, with the paranoia and cruelty that distinguished him, arrested them all on charges of conspiring to assassinate the prince. Both Ricard Stark, Lord of Winterfell, and Brandon Stark, his eldest son, were charged with treason. What do you have to say for yourselves, said the Mad King. Ricard, a man who epitomizes northern toughness, looks around and his gaze meets his son's. I demand a trial by combat, said the Stark father. Remember that the Starks were known to be great warriors, they trained from birth, and were famous for winning many battles. The Starks thought this would be a way to escape accusations of treason. The Mad King, with a twisted smile on his face, accepts the demand. But his champion was not a man, but fire. Ricard is raised on a pyre in the middle of the throne room. At that moment, Brandon is led to the center of the room, with a torture device around his neck, and a sword tantalizingly placed just out of his reach. Sitting on the Iron Throne, Ares declares his sentence. Your father's life is in your hands Brandon. All you have to do is reach for the sword. The artifact on Brandon's neck squeezed him tighter and tighter as he drew closer to the sword. As the flames began to burn, both father and son lost their lives. Ricard at the hands of the Targaryen fire, and Brandon because of that artifact on his neck, which deprived him of his life when he tried to reach the sword. This cruel execution was not only an act of unbridled madness, but also the catalyst for Robert's rebellion. Next, the North receives the news of the death of Brandon Stark and his father, and this is when Ned and Robert swore revenge. While Lyanna's father and brother were losing their lives at King's Landing, on the other side of the world, Lyanna and Rhaegar were getting married. It is here that the most interesting part of this story begins. As the bodies of Ned Stark's father and brother were consumed by the flames, the Mad King issued a shocking command. He sent a message to John Aaron, the Lord of the Eyrie, with a dreadful request. He was to deliver his pupils, Ned Stark and Robert Baratheon, to be executed. The Mad King, gripped by paranoia and fear, was convinced that these young nobles would seek revenge for the death of the Starks, and he was not entirely wrong. However, he had underestimated the bond between John Aaron and his mentes. John Aaron was not only Ned and Robert's mentor, he had raised them as his own sons. His loyalty to them far outweighed any sense of duty he might have to House Targaryen. Faced with the choice between obeying the king's command or protecting his pupils, John Aaron made a brave and transcendent decision. He refused to surrender Ned and Robert. Instead, he chose to fight. To fight for the lives of these boys, for justice, and ultimately for the future of the Seven Kingdoms. Robert swore to Ned that he would find his sister Lyanna, and help him avenge his parents. Ned swore to Robert that he would join him in battle, and together they destroyed the tyrannical Mad King. It was the year 263 after the conquest. The frozen lands of the north side under the blanket of a cold winter. This winter would bring with it the birth of one of the most important wolves of House Stark. In the ancestral castle of Winterfell a boy was born, Eddard Stark, better known as Ned. His arrival seemed a promise to the world, a new wolf who would grow up to defy the endless winter storm, and fate had in store for him a fight against dragons. Ned's early life was spent in the cold halls and snow-covered fields of Winterfell, growing up in the shadow of his older brother, Brandon, the heir to House Stark. Brandon was distinguished by his bravery and charisma, shining like the sun in the northern sky. In contrast, Ned was quieter, thoughtful, and with a more subtle but equally walkers. Ned studied with dedication the history and genealogy of every noble house in the Seven Kingdoms. He learned from their exploits and defeats, from their alliances and betrayals. From his father's hand, he all John, a man of immense dignity and honor, with a wisdom forged by years of war and politics, became a father figure to Ned, being his guide in this new world. 
The Airy, home of the Aarons, stood on a mountain. A castle defying gravity and nature. It was here, in these high cold towers, that the young Stark would have to face new challenges, a more rigorous education, and the absence of his home and family. But he was not alone in this task. Robert Baratheon, a young nobleman of House Baratheon from Storm's End, shared his fate. Ned Stark's childhood was also shaped by the close relationship he had with his younger brother Ben Jen. Although there are not many details of their childhood relationship, it is known that they shared a strong bond, forged in the harsh northern winter. This atmosphere, both strange and dazzling, caused between Ned and Robert, a camaraderie that soon became a deep bond. They trained together, wielding real swords instead of the wooden ones that children of their age played with. They learned together listening to John Aaron's lessons on history, strategy, and leadership. They would spend long nights of conversation together, telling stories from their homes, and sharing dreams of a future of greatness. But everything changed after the great tournament at Heron Hall. Rumors reached the north that Lyanna Stark, Ned's beloved sister, had been kidnapped by the Dragon Prince, Rhaegar Targaryen. Brandon Stark sent a letter to his brother Eddard, who was in the Vale of Arryn, warning that he would go with his father to King's Landing to confront the Dragon Prince, for his sister's honor. We already know what happened, the Mad King killed Brandon and Ned Stark's father. A message quickly reached John Aaron, asking him to hand over his pupils, but he refused. He knew that the Mad King had become paranoid and would end the boys' lives, so John vowed to fight alongside them. As news of the tragic deaths of Brandon and Ricard Stark reached the north, the Mad King was preparing in King's Landing to annihilate all those he considered his enemies. Fire and blood had blinded the former monarch, and it was only a matter of time before his closest allies betrayed him. The indomitable force of madness stalked mercilessly the mind of one who was once considered the most intelligent Targaryen. Ares, known as the Mad King, was the last member of his legendary house to occupy the Iron Throne. However, his reign was short-lived and devastating, because before being betrayed by his own men, he made a series of decisions that triggered the downfall and disgrace of his own family. The history of Westeros witnessed high and tragic points, but none like the reign of Ares, the last link to be broken. From the beginning of his rule, a change in his behavior could be glimpsed. His actions were increasingly unpredictable, his judgment became dark and twisted, and his thirst for power overflowed. The signs of his madness were undeniable, and this was a grim outcome for the Targaryens. However, before the treachery of his own men led to his final defeat, Ares made reckless and ruthless decisions that doomed his family. He engaged in senseless crusades, such as burning nobles and vassals alive, claiming they were traitors. His paranoia led him to consider as enemies those who had sworn loyalty to him, sowing discord and distrust in his own forces. At that time, House Lannister, led by Tywin Lannister, took advantage of the instability and imbalance of the crown, to advance their own agendas. The Mad King, Ares Targaryen II, was born in the year 244 after the conquest. From birth, Ares was destined for greatness or tragedy. However, before he was the Mad King, he was an ambitious prince, enamored with the idea of absolute power, and eager to prove himself. Upon ascending the throne in the year 262 after the conquest, Ares II promised a new era of prosperity and power for the Seven Kingdoms. He replaced his father's and grandfather's old advisors with vigorous young men, among them his childhood friend, Sir Tywin Lannister. Ares appreciated Tywin's toughness and appointed him Hand of the King, a role Tywin performed with brutal efficiency. The relationship between Ares and Tywin was complex, intertwined with ambitions and rivalries, but for several years, their alliance allowed the Seven Kingdoms to flourish. 
However, the Mad King lusted after the Lannister lion's wife. It is said that he wanted Joanna Lannister, Tywin's wife, and that during the wedding of Tywin and Joanna, the king got drunk and made a distasteful comment. The Mad King said it was a pity that the king's right to be with the bride on the first wedding night had been abolished. This comment caused Tywin's annoyance, and it is something he never forgot. It is also mentioned, that during the wedding the Mad King took other liberties. The books tell that Joanna became pregnant with the twins Jaime and Cersei, while she was away from King's Landing. But Joanna lost her life during her childbirth, in the year 273 after the conquest. A year after her return to King's Landing, his younger sister was unhappy, and Ares had a string of mistresses. The series of lifeless births, miscarriages, and the premature death of the couple's children worsened Ares' mental health. His paranoia and madness began to take their toll, to the point of accusing Rayla of infidelity, and locking her up in Mager's keep. The king and his hand, once friends, saw their relationship deteriorate rapidly. Ares' paranoia extended to Tywin, whom he began to see as a threat to his power. Despite his mental deterioration, Ares was still capable of shrewd political moves, appointing Jaime Lannister, Tywin's son, as King's Guard. This masterstroke was a devastating blow to Tywin. As a member of the King's Guard, Jaime could not inherit his father's lands and titles, and moreover, he would be permanently in the King's service. In this way, Ares managed to neutralize Tywin, depriving him of his heir, and ensuring that he had a hostage against any move by the Lannister Lion. Ares continued his reign of terror and paranoia, increasingly isolated and fearful. As his madness increased, so did his cruelty and distrust of everyone around him. His madness reached such a point that he began to enjoy fire, and to burn alive those he suspected to be plotting against him, earning him the nickname of the Mad King. In a desperate attempt to maintain control, Ares made a series of erratic and counterproductive decisions. The most notorious was to name his own son, Viserys, as his heir, bypassing Rhaegar, in an act that made it clear that he no longer trusted his own lineage. Ares' paranoia also affected his relationship with the Hand of the King, Tywin Lannister. Ares began to suspect Tywin of coveting the throne for himself, and his paranoia was compounded when Prince Rhaegar Targaryen allegedly kidnapped Lyanna Stark. The Lannisters knew it was only a matter of time before the Targaryens fell, but they had not yet begun their actions against the dragon. Tywin Lannister simply decided to resign, and wait for the right moment to take revenge on the Mad King. Owen Merriweather became the new Hand of the King. However, this position did not last him long, as Ares' madness became more evident every day, and the fire gradually consumed what little sanity he had left. Whether it was the desire for power, the desire to avenge his wife, or the pain of losing his heir, Tywin Lannister slowly became the Mad King's worst enemy. Ares was too preoccupied with finding the traitors in his house, and without knowing it, he was causing the destruction of his family with his actions. This point leads us to the moment when John Aaron refuses the order to hand over Robert Baratheon and Eddard Stark. John Aaron takes a bold stand and defies the Mad King, declaring war on him. During this time, many noble houses had suffered greatly due to the cruelty of the Mad King, who mercilessly burned anyone he considered suspicious. When these noble houses learned about the rebellion, they did not hesitate to join the cause. However, not all shared John Aaron's position, many still maintained their loyalty to the Targaryen. Thus, the Seven Kingdoms were plunged into chaos. In the north, armies were preparing to march. The Starks were determined to avenge the fallen and rescue Lyanna. As word of Robert's rebellion began to spread throughout Westeros, and civil conflicts erupted in every city, the weather on the continent also underwent a drastic change. It was a time of turmoil and chaos, with internal fights emerging in every corner of the realm. Parallel to these political and social tensions, 
a severe weather change hit Westeros. As the end of the year approached, winter once again struck Westeros with unprecedented severity. On the last day of the year, a thick blanket of snow covered King's Landing, and Blackwater became a surface of ice. For nearly two weeks, snow fell intermittently, transforming the roofs and gutters of all the city's towers into icy landscapes. At the Mad King's command, for an entire moon, immense bonfires of green fire rose skyward, devouring everything in their path, and crackling with an ethereal glow beside the ramparts of the Red Keep. This splendid yet terrifying spectacle was visible to everyone in the city, its greenish glow reflecting on their astonished faces. Ares' blind trust in the magic of the pyromancers to control the weather and manipulate the forces of nature to his will demonstrated his disconnection with reality and his growing mental instability. But his attempt proved to be in vain. No matter how much he wished or how much magical power he tried to employ, he could not stop the storm that was advancing relentlessly from the north. As the weather was changing, so was the course of Targaryen history. What once had been a dynasty of dragon kings now stood on the brink of extinction. The great absentee during this crisis was Rhaegar Targaryen, who was in hiding with Lyanna Stark and Dorne. Meanwhile, Robert Baratheon, Ned Stark and Jon Arryn were in the valley, attracting more and more followers to their cause, but also enemies. The first great enemy was Lord Grafton, who said that he maintained his support for the Targaryen reign, and that he would never surrender Gultown. It is here that the first great battle begins with the capture of Gultown in the year 282 after the conquest. The news of Lord Grafton traveled like lightning through the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. His decision to raise the banner in favor of the Targaryens was a clear act of defiance against Robert Baratheon and his rebellion. Gultown, a coastal city that stood proudly in the Vale region, now became a pivotal point in the battle for the throne. Lord Grafton, backed by his loyalty to the Targaryens, had closed the city gates and was preparing for an attack. But Robert Baratheon was not a man to be easily intimidated. He gathered his men, and under the darkness of night, sailed toward the city. The pounding of the waves against his ship seemed to be in sync with his heartbeat, each heralding the impending battle. At dawn, Gultown awoke to the sound of war trumpets. The city's first line of defense barely had time to react before Robert and his men breached the city gates. Lord Grafton's guards tried to resist, but could not hold back the onslaught. Men rushed to arm the city's defenses, women sought shelter for their children, and nobles prepared for an imminent fight. Robert was the first to cross the city walls. His imposing stature, the war hammer firmly gripped in his hand, and the determination reflected in his face, intimidated everyone present. With a bravery that could only come from unshakable conviction, Robert threw himself into battle. Lord Grafton's men awaited him, swords drawn, and faces marked by a mixture of fear and determination. But no man could match Robert's fury on the battlefield. Each blow of his hammer was like thunder, striking down men who dared to stand in his way. Then Lord Grafton emerged from the crowd, defiant and determined to defend his city. He faced Robert with his sword raised high. But it was evident to all present that he was no match for the Lord of Storm's end. They exchanged blows, but it was Robert who had the upper hand. With a final and definitive move, Robert struck with his war hammer, knocking Lord Grafton down. The battle was silenced for an instant. All eyes were on the fallen figure of Lord Grafton and the undisputed victor, Robert Baratheon. With Lord Grafton defeated, resistance in the city began to fade. Robert marked his victory when he raised his banner, a majestic black crow on a field of gold, on the walls of Goldtown. It was a powerful message to the other lords of Westeros, 
demonstrating that Robert Baratheon had become a danger, not only to this city in the north, but to all of Westeros. After Robert Baratheon's victory at Gulltown, news of the battle spread quickly throughout the Seven Kingdoms. The echo of the triumph resounded to the very walls of the Red Keep, reaching the ears of the Mad King. Ares, already quite unstable and paranoid these days, received the news of the fall of Gulltown and the death of Lord Grafton with a mixture of fury and fear. Despite his many faults, Ares was fully aware of what this victory meant for the rebels. It was a blow to his authority and a clear message that Robert Baratheon and his allies did not fear his reign. The Mad King, in his growing desperation and paranoia, increased his efforts to crush the rebellion. He gave orders to his men to put down the revolt, regardless of the cost in lives, and the suffering for his people. The Battle of Gulltown was a turning point in Robert's rebellion. An event that demonstrated the growing strength of the rebels, and marked the beginning of the end for the reign of Ares Targaryen II. In the darkest period of the reign under Ares II, his mental health deteriorated even more after the multiple victories of Robert's army. The echo of Robert Baratheon's successes resounded in Ares' ears, each victory was a hammer that hit his sanity, crumbling it little by little, increasing his paranoia. In the heart of a war that tore the lands of the realm apart, Prince Rhaegar stood before the storm, forced to face the approaching storm. The responsibility on his shoulders was not only to lead the forces loyal to his father but also to carry the honor and hope of his family. In his eyes was an unwavering determination, a burning flame of passion for his country and his people. Rhaegar had neglected his position as heir to the throne, his mind had turned to prophecy and music, in addition to his great love for Lyanna. It is at this time that Rhaegar learns about Lyanna's pregnancy, and possibly agrees with her to name the baby Aegon Targaryen, as he wished to fulfill the prophecy of the prince that was promised. However, Robert's side was not concerned with ancient prophecies, but only wanted to end the Targaryens and regain the love of his life. The battle between Rhaegar and Robert was trying to determine who would be worthy of having Lyanna as a wife. On the one hand, Robert thought that Lyanna was kidnapped, and on the other hand, Rhaegar was only trying to defend his love for his wife. While Rhaegar planned, the wheels of war kept turning. Storm's End, a fortress of unrivaled sturdiness, came under siege, and its fall marked a heavy blow to the heart of the Targaryen resistance. Robert recaptured Storm's End and proclaimed himself the true lord of Storm's End. From the burning lands of Dorne, an army of 10,000 spears marched northward, carrying in their hearts the defense of Princess Elia. Each step they took toward King's Landing resounded like a thunderclap of hope and determination. However, in the clutches of the Mad King's paranoia, young Jaime Lannister was treated as a hostage, a golden lion chained to the madness of his king. It was then that the confrontation between Robert's army and Rhaegar Targaryen's army began. As the armies drew closer, the air filled with tension. Haste and anticipation could be tasted, almost like the iron and dust that soon filled the air. Both sides moved with a kind of fatal grace, advancing toward the place where the fates of all in the Seven Kingdoms would change. Prince Rhaegar and Robert Baratheon, two towering figures on the battlefield, stared at each other. As if in their own world, they launched themselves at each other. Robert, in his black armor and cloak adorned with the fury of the rampant stag. Rhaegar, in his shining armor adorned with rubies, his face as beautiful as the dawn, mounted on his battle steed, like a vision out of an ancient song. The clash of steel against steel echoed across the battlefield. The force of his onslaught was such that for a moment, time seemed to stand still. All around them, men fought and died, but for them, everything else was secondary. This was a personal fight, a fight that would decide the fate of the Seven Kingdoms. 
The fight was fierce and brutal, worthy of song and legend. On the open plain, over a sea of waving grass, tension gripped the air, thick as the early morning fog. Two men, both leaders, both warriors, stood facing each other. Robert Baratheon, fury personified, and Rhaegar Targaryen, elegance in the midst of the storm. Robert wielded his warhammer, a monster of iron and wood, it was a weapon so overwhelmingly powerful, only a man of Robert's brutish strength could wield it. His face was creased in a grimace of pure rage, his gaze fixed on Rhaegar with a fire that threatened to consume everything. In front of him, Rhaegar appeared almost ethereal in his blackened armor, a slender figure that seemed to dance in the sunlight. He was the epitome of grace and prowess, the last hope of a millennial-old dynasty. Unlike Robert, Rhaegar's expression was calm, almost resigned, as if accepting the cruel fate the war had imposed on him. With a roar, Robert charged his hammer swinging in a deadly arc. The ground shook with his fury, and the air buzzed with the power of his blow. Rhaegar, with the agility of a dancer, dodged aside, his spear seeking the gap in Robert's armor. But Robert was an unstoppable force. He charged his hammer again, striking with the force of lightning. Then it happened. Robert connected. His hammer slammed into Rhaegar's armor with a deafening sound, a storm of steel against steel. The impact was so powerful that the rubies embedded in Rhaegar's breastplate broke loose, splattering the river like a shower of blood. With that blow, Robert Baratheon had not only defeated a prince, he had struck the final nail in the coffin of the Targaryen dynasty. With Rhaegar lay buried the last hope of the House of the Dragon. No more dragons would fly over the Seven Kingdoms, and no more silver-haired regents would sit on the Iron Throne. The hope of the prophecy of the prince that was promised, the one who was destined to bring salvation, vanished with Rhaegar's last breath. Meanwhile, far from the heat of battle Rhaegar's beloved, Lyanna Stark, endured the pains of motherhood. Locked in the Tower of Joy, Lyanna was oblivious to the fateful destiny of her beloved. Her sighs of grief mingled with the echoes of a war being waged in her name. A war that was about to change the fate of the Seven Kingdoms forever. In the shadows of King's Landing, the paranoia of Ares, the Mad King, was beginning to take an even darker turn. His eyes burned madly as he plotted to set the capital ablaze, preferring to see it consumed by Dragonfire rather than in the hands of the rebels. Robert, with Rhaegar's death still fresh on his hands, longed to return to Lyanna, though she did not feel the same way. After Jon Snow's father's death, the Mad King, Ares Targaryen II, turned his attention and desperate hope to the Pyromancers. This ancient order was dedicated to studying and manipulating the ancient fire forces. The Pyromancers, who were part of the ancient and respected alchemists guild, have had a powerful and feared influence throughout the history of Westeros. This venerable order, also known as the Guild of Alchemists, was primarily concerned with the pursuit of ancestral knowledge. They were dedicated to the study of the ancient forces of fire, and over the centuries, perfected the creation and manipulation of Valyrian fire or the fire of the gods, a fiery substance with unparalleled destructive power. The rise and fall of the alchemists is deeply intertwined with the history of Westeros, and in particular, with the reign of Ares II. Pyromancers are an enigmatic and fundamental group in the Song of Ice and Fire universe. Their ancient lineage and deep knowledge of fire, the devastating Valyrian fire in particular, have shaped the history of Westeros in ways that will resonate long after their heyday. The Guild of Alchemists dates back to the times of Valyria, an ancient and powerful civilization whose mastery of fire was unmatched. The Valyrian master alchemists were known for their skill in manipulating Valyrian fire, a weapon so devastating that it was instrumental in consolidating Valyria's supremacy in the Seven Kingdoms. The fall of Valyria in a cataclysm known as the Doom of Valyria put an end to its golden age and marked the beginning of the pyromancer's decline. 
However, the ability to manipulate Valyrian fire was not completely lost. The Order of the Alchemists, with its ancient practices and knowledge, managed to survive the course of time. The influence and effects of pyromancers upon the life and reign of Ares Targaryen II, the Mad King, are a matter of great debate. Many believe that the pyromancers were catalytic elements in Ares' downward spiral of madness, exacerbating his obsession with fire and his paranoia. The alchemists, in their quest for power and status, did not hesitate to feed the king's obsession, facilitating his most destructive ideas and encouraging his growing desire for violence. It has even been speculated that the Guild of Alchemists was responsible for some of the greatest tragedies in the history of Westeros. Some maintain the theory that the pyromancers, with their constant experimentation and manipulation of Valyrian fire, were the true cause of the doom of Valyria. This cataclysm, which marked the end of the great civilization of Valyria, is seen by some as the inevitable result of human interference, in forces beyond their comprehension. Another tragedy linked to pyromancers is the Summer Hall Fire, the summer residence of House Targaryen. This terrible incident, which resulted in the deaths of several members of the royal family, has been attributed to a failed attempt to hatch dragon eggs using Valyrian fire. Some believe that the alchemists were behind this incident, either through their incompetence or as part of a larger plot. However, despite the tragedies and rumors, Ares saw in the pyromancers a replacement for the dragons his family no longer had. In his madness, Ares came to see Valyrian fire as an extension of his will and a means to exert his power. The pyromancers, with their ability to create and control this fire, became his most valued advisors, a replacement for the dragons that were once the key to the Targaryen's power. By the time Ares Targaryen ascended to the throne, the pyromancers had lost much of their former influence and status. However, Ares' growing fascination with fire and the destruction it can cause offered the pyromancers a unique opportunity to regain their power and relevance. The king, fearing the loss of his throne due to the growing rebellion led by Robert Baratheon, desperately saw any advantage that might ensure his survival. In desperation, Ares saw in the pyromancers the way to retain his power. He formed with them an incendiary alliance, a pact with the only ones capable of creating Valyrian fire. Fascinated by fire, especially by its ability to terrorize and destroy, Ares became obsessed with creating a world of fire, on which his enemies would burn. After Rhaegar's death, Ares orchestrated a chilling and ruthless plan. He commissioned pyromancers to hide Valyrian fire throughout the city of King's Landing. In his twisted mind, if he could not contain the rebels, then the entire city would burn along with him. King's Landing became, under his rule, a death trap with every street and building threatened by flames. Ares' plan to use Valyrian fire to destroy the capital in the event of a rebel attack was a manifestation of his madness and desperation. In fact, this alliance between the king and the pyromancers was a reflection of Ares' overflowing madness. He meticulously planned his own self-destruction, and that of his city, threatening to turn King's Landing into a field of ashes. May their skin blackened and blistered and melted off their bones. He loved to watch people burn. He burned lords he didn't like. He burned hands who disobeyed him. He burned anyone who was against him. Before long, half the country was against him. So he had his pyromancers caches of wildfire all over the city. After Rhaegar Targaryen's death in battle, the king's messengers arrived to deliver the news and King Ares cursed the Dornish, thinking they had betrayed his son Rhaegar. To protect his family, Ares sent his wife Rayla, who was pregnant with Daenerys, and their infant son Viserys to Dragonstone. But he forced Princess Elia and Rhaegar's children to stay in King's Landing, to ensure that the Dornish would not turn against him. He also appointed one of his pyromancers to be his hand. In his paranoid rant, the Mad King saw enemies everywhere and decided that if he could not reign in life, 
he would reign from death over a kingdom of ashes. However, a brilliant young knight who had risen to the king's guard at the age of 16 had sworn to protect the king, even at the cost of his own life. But the young man's loyalty was put to an insurmountable test when he became aware of Ares' plan. Faced with an impossible choice, he had to choose between fulfilling his vows and allowing thousands of innocents to die, or breaking his promises and saving the city and his own family. From an early age, Jamie showed an innate ability for combat and became an expert swordsman. From his birth into the wealthiest house of the Seven Kingdoms, Jamie Lannister was destined for a life of privilege and responsibility. As the eldest son of Lord Tywin Lannister and Joanna Lannister, Jamie's lineage was both a burden and a blessing. Jamie grew up in the shadow of his family. His siblings, Cersei and Tyrion, held a significant place in his life. Despite the tragic circumstances of Tyrion's birth, which resulted in the death of his mother, Jamie always showed a degree of love and respect for him, unlike Tywin and Cersei. With Cersei, Jamie shared a different bond, a bond much more than that of a sister, one that later became the epicenter of most of his problems. At the age of 16, Jamie was promoted to the knighthood, an honor that was in contrast to the dark secret of his relationship with Cersei. In an attempt to avoid his father's marriage plans with Liza Tully, Jamie joined the King's Guard. This act came despite the reservations of his father, who saw Jamie's inclusion in the King's Guard as a threat to his legacy, as Jamie could not inherit his lands or titles. With Tywin's refusal to recognize Tyrion as his heir, this left House Lannister in a precarious position. But as we learned at the beginning of this story, the Mad King held a very large grudge against Tywin, and did everything he could to keep young Jamie kidnapped. Jamie's inclusion in the King's Guard was part of a larger plan, as Cersei was to be betrothed to Prince Rhaegar, allowing them to be together in King's Landing. However, the plans fell through when Tywin angrily resigned his position as Hand of the King, driving Cersei back to Casterly Rock. Jamie was sworn into the King's Guard by the Mad King, Ares Targaryen II, during the Great Tournament at Harrenhal. However, no one could have foreseen the impact Robert's rebellion had in Westeros. After Rhaegar's death, it was only a matter of time before Ares' head would be on a spike. So Jaime decided to protect him, however, the arrival of the Lannister army at King's Landing changed everything. One day, the gates of the great city of King's Landing trembled under the weight of the Lannister army, led by Tywin, Jaime's own father. Jaime, knowing his father's character, warned the Mad King that he should not allow the Lannisters to enter, for something was about to happen. Possibly, Jaime knew that his father would take advantage of this moment of weakness of the Mad King, to take revenge for all that this dictator had done to him. But the king, confused and desperate, preferred to listen to Grand Maester Pycelle, who, manipulated by Tywin, advised the king to trust the Lannisters. And so, the gates of the city opened for the Lannisters, as they arrived not as friends, but as enemies in disguise. The city, once bustling and vibrant, became a pandemonium of looting and violence. As Tywin's men ransacked the streets, holed up in his fortress, King Aerys went completely mad. In his madness, he ordered them all burned, planning to set the entire city ablaze, with no regard for the lives of the innocent. At that moment, Jaime found himself in a dilemma. He had sworn to protect the king, but he also knew that he could not allow the fire to consume the city and its people. In an act of desperate bravery, he decided to break his oath to save thousands. As the Mad King shouted, burn them all, with a single thrust of his sword, Jaime ended his life. He told me to bring him my father's head. Then he turned to his pyromancer. Burn them all, he said. Burn them in their homes, burn them in their beds. When the smoke cleared and the city was saved, Jamie was not hailed as a hero, but earned the nickname of Kingslayer.
What about Aerys Targaryen? I never asked. What did the Mad King say when you stabbed him in the back? Did he plead for a reprieve? Did he call you a traitor? He said the same thing he'd been saying for hours. Burn them all. From that moment on, he carried the weight of his decision, a weight that haunted him until the end of his days. Jamie's choice at that moment defined his life, a testament that sometimes doing the right thing can be the hardest act of all. After the death of King Aerys II, the lives of the surviving Targaryens were in extreme danger, and servants loyal to the royal house took desperate measures to protect the remaining heirs. Daenerys and her older brother Viserys were sent to the distant free city of Braavos across the narrow sea to keep them safe from the war raging in Westeros. Although Robert's rebellion ended with the death of the Mad King, we still have yet to learn what happened next, how Robert was crowned, and how Ned returned to Winterfell to raise the last hope of the House of the Dragon, a boy who was just opening his eyes to a new world, Jon Snow. But that's a story for a future video. But tell me what are your thoughts on all this? Do you think that all that happened was a necessary evil for the greater good of the realm? And if you liked this content, I invite you to become a member of this channel. Each contributor will see their name at the end of all videos. And for more videos with theories, news, and stories from the Game of Thrones universe, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. You are on. The Three-Eyed Raven